so a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, good evening, everyone from this part of the world, and good afternoon and good morning, respectively, depending on your time zones. I'm Sri Rupa, and on behalf of Institute of Social Studies Trust and Heinrich Bolz Stiftung Regional Office, New Delhi, I welcome you to the 35th Gender and Economic Policy Discussion Forum on understanding body politics in the context of big data and information society. This year marks the 10th year of the Gender and Economic Policy Discussion Forum, and I would request Rajiv Nandi, Associate Director, ISST, to speak about the forum and the long ISST HBS collaboration. Over to you, Rajiv. Yeah, thank you, Sirupa. Uh, good evening, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome the chair, the speakers, and the participants to the 35th Gender and Economic Policy Discussion Forum on behalf of the Institute of Social Studies Trust and uh, Henry Paul uh, Stiftung, Regional Office, New Delhi. I'm sure you know about uh, Institute of Social Studies Trust and Henry Paul Stiftung, but let me introduce these two organizations in short. Uh, Institute of Social Studies Trust uh, is constituted as a public charitable trust in 1980. ICST has a long connection with the women's movement of India since 1950s and initiated and ran uh, several network movements in the last four decades. Uh, ICST positions itself between research and research action and policy as far as the programmatic activities are concerned. ICST conducts empirical and policy research capacity building in gender transformative research and evaluation apart from its community development programs. On the other hand, uh, Henry Gold Stiftung is a German think tank for green visions and projects. The foundation maintains close ties to the uh, German Green Party. At present, they are part of an international network encompassing 30 international offices with over 100 partner projects in appro approximately 60 countries. The Henrik Boll Foundation works independently and nurtures a spirit of intellectual openness. ICST and uh, Henrik Boll uh, Stiftung started this uh, program in 2012. So with this uh, forum today, uh, we are entering into the 10th year of this journey. We launched a gender policy discussion forum in 2012 with an objective to initiate high quality policy debates around contemporary and relevant issues from a gender perspective. The forum brought experts from different sectors, uh, starting from academics and scholars to practitioners and uh, gender advocates towards creating a space for interactive discussions. Secondly, and more importantly, uh, the forums recorded the voices of people and agencies who otherwise don't contribute so much in writing. We, uh, on behalf of ICST, thank Henrik Bo Stiftung for this association and support for over the last nine years. Between 2012, uh, between 2012 and 2019, we organized 13 forums, uh, all in physical, I mean, face-to-face uh, -face mode. Last year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we shifted to online mode and uh, organized three online forums. We definitely miss the informal and in-depth interactions while having our tea and lunch. But I must mention here that through the online mode, uh, uh, Though we could include a wide range of speakers and participants across India and beyond, but perhaps missed many more due to uh, the digital divide. I also like to mention here that uh, you may please find the policy briefs of all 34 forums that we have organized so far uh, uh, in our websites, both in the ICST website and Henry Cole's Stiftung website. This year's uh, theme uh, has been organized to understand body politics in the context of data and information society. Uh, penetration uh, of information technologies and smartphones have made debates surrounding embodiment, technological bodies, and data governance. Gadgets, technologies, and media are in, uh, uh, increasingly becoming part of our bodies and embodiment. I think today's forum will raise the critical questions whether these systems strengthen the long term social inequalities and deepen identity based discrimination and reinforce pre existing cultural practices and biases, or creating opportunities for raising voices and alternative spaces for the marginalized communities for meaningful engagement. So, looking forward to exciting uh, presentations and participations. Thank you, and over to you, Sri. Thank you, Rajiv. Um... As uh, Rajiv mentioned, this year's online forum has been organized to understand body politics in the context of data and information society. Um, 
more, uh, and this is a very pertinent discussion, I think, at this time. And some of the specific questions that we would like to be raised and discussed in this forum are uh, on the lines of that we need to understand what it means to reframe our existing database governance framework through an embodiment lens. How do we begin to talk about body politics in an age when it becomes difficult to disassociate bodies and technologies? How does a focus on bodily integrity and viewing surveillance from a feminist perspective help bring attention to gender outcomes of surveilling technologies? And uh, more talk about gender transformative interventions, what are the some of the strategies and best practices uh, which could help the civil society organizations to contribute towards an information society that upholds embodied experiences and freedoms for all. So these are some of the questions that we hope to address during this discussion. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel with us today. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Vishakha Datta, who would be chairing today's panel. Vishakha Datta is a filmmaker and an activist. She works on gender and sexuality in digital spaces, runs the non-profit Point of View in Mumbai, writes and films non-fiction, and is part of the Wikipedia family. In all her work, Vishakha explores marginal, invisible, and silenced points of view for those considered illegitimate. Her documentary work includes In the Flesh, a film on the lives of three sex workers, and Taza Khabar, which explores a unique women-run rural newspaper. She's edited two anthologies, one on rural women in politics, the other on gender-based violence. Vishakha is also a co-founder of Deep Dives, an award-winning online publication, which publishes long-form narratives. So it is a pleasure to have you with us, Vishakha. Uh, thanks a lot. As part of our panel, we have with us Dr. Anya Kovacs, who is the director of the Internet Democracy Project in Delhi, India. Anya's current research and advocacy focuses on questions regarding data governance, surveillance, and cybersecurity, and regarding freedoms of expression, including work on gender, bodies, surveillance, and data violence, and gender and online abuse. She has also conducted extensive research on the architecture of internet governance. Anya has lectured in the UK, India, and Brazil, and has worked as an international consultant on internet issues, including for the UNDP. Having previously been a fellow at the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, she's currently a CyberBricks non-resident fellow at the FGV Rio de Janeiro. She obtained her PhD in development studies from the University of East Anglia in the UK and has conducted extensive fieldwork across South Asia. Thanks a lot for joining us today, uh, Anya. Uh, and as part of our panel, uh, we also have today Rohini Lakshini. Rohini is a technologist, public policy researcher, and Wikimedian. An engineer by training, Lakshini has worked on several research and advocacy projects at the intersection of technology, policy, and civil liberties. Her body of work encompasses diverse uh, territories, such as the application of technology and policy to solve issues of gender inequity and violence. Access to knowledge, openness, making tech spaces diverse and inclusive, and the crosshairs of gender, sexuality, and the internet. Finally, we have with us Brinda Lakshmi K. Brinda Lakshmi is a researcher, advocacy, and training professional working at the intersection of human rights, identities, and technology. They authored the study, Gendering of Development Data in India, Beyond the Binary for the Center for Internet and Society, as part of the Big Data for Development Network. Apart from their engagement with different communities as an activist, they are also a peer supporter working with the LGBTIQA plus community in Tamil Nadu, India. So welcome uh, all the panelists. Uh, a few notes for our uh, participants. Uh, so before proceeding to the presentation of our speakers, I'd like to inform our participants that this event is being recorded. Kindly post your questions, comments in the chat box, and we will try our best to address them post all the presentations. The presentations are planned to be around 12 minutes each, and we would be proceeding to the discussions right away after that. So it is my pleasure to welcome and hand over the floor to Bishakha Datta. Uh, I request you to kindly present your opening remark on today's topic following which we would move on to the first presentation. Vishakha, over to you. Thank you so much, Sri Rupa, and thank you so much to ISST and the Heinrich Doll Stiftung for inviting me to this. Um, I also wanted to, I'm very, very happy to be in the company of panelists who have deeply influenced my thinking on these issues. 
And I also wanted to tell our fellow panelists that what I will do is uh, in terms of moderation, since we want to leave enough time for questions, I will privately message you all when roughly 10 minutes is up to alert you all that we have two minutes left and then message you all privately again. Um, okay, so with that, I just wanted to set up a few sort of um, things that may help us think through some of the issues that we're going to discuss today. Actually, the phrase that has been going around my head the entire day is the title of a book, which is one of my favorites. And the book is actually called Written on the Body by the author Jeanette Winterson. And I was speculating that, you know, if Jeanette Winterson had to write this book today, what would Jeanette Winterson identify as the body itself in the digital age, right? Where might an author like Winterson place the boundaries of the body? Would Winterson think of the body today as a corporeal flesh and blood physical body purely? Or would Jeanette Winterson actually think of the body today as partly flesh and blood, tangible, but also partly a little intangible, but sort of spilling over or taking a digital form, which is a little harder to think about. And I wanted to actually acknowledge uh, my indebtedness to Anya Kovach for really reframing my understanding of the relationship between bodies and data this is something that we experience on a day-to-day -day level, right? As we use everything from messenger apps to social media, when we go to health centers, which store medical data about our body, in the way welfare schemes are rolled out, which are based on identification nowadays, but that too has a big data or digital component to even when we cross toll booths, you know, which store data about our travel. So I think one of the things that we've come to increasingly understand over the last few years is that many aspects of the physical body are being translated into digital code and information, right? And several scholars, including Irma van der Klug, note that in the last few years, in the last few decades, actually, although we are recognizing it now, a new body has been emerging. It's a body that is defined in terms of information, who you are, how you are, and how you are going to be treated in various situations, to quote her, is increasingly known to various agents and agencies through information deriving from your own body, information that is processed elsewhere through the networks, databases, and algorithms of the information society. In other words, if we really think about it, our bodies are no longer just material of flesh and blood. We are all bodies of information. We are all bodies of data in a sense. So again, just to think about this a little bit, what does this mean? Is this just an abstraction or does this really have an impact on our politics, our movements, etc.? I would actually argue that so much of the work of feminist movements to which I belong is centered on the body, right? On the gendered body. And so much of it is really about thinking through everything about the gendered body uh, in the domain of patriarchy, right? From, you know, how it is fed, how it sleeps, how it is clothed, who our bodies are allowed to desire, love, who, which bodies go hungry, which bodies face violence or get abused, which bodies experience well-being, etc. And in keeping with this, what we find is that in the last few years, increasingly, all these big questions, be it the fundamental question of identity, be it questions of gender identity, be it questions of uh, sexuality and reproduction, you know, the way we express desire via social media, dating apps, the way we sexually connect across distances, etc. All of these practices are generating data about 
individual and collective preferences, practices, and patterns. So as our sexuality, our desires turn into data, there are also new questions emerging for multiple movements, including feminist movements in particular, as well as queer movements, around autonomy, bodily integrity, and consent. And before I hand it over to the first speaker, I just want to actually end with a little anecdote. In a landmark 2015 case in the United States, a woman who had filed a sexual assault report was accused of making false claims. She said she was asleep at the time of the assault, but she was wearing uh, the Fitbit device on her wrist. And the Fitbit data showed that she was awake and moving. She was charged with false reporting, making a false alarm and tampering with evidence. In other words, the data was believed over the body. Um, and so I think this is sort of, you know, we are at a complicated moment uh, where the digitization of our society, our systems and our lifestyles has led us down a path of putting more faith in the data than in the body itself. And this is an additional challenge. So without further ado, I am actually, there are many, many fascinating sort of dimensions of this that the speakers will go into. So I will not go any further, but without further ado, I would like to hand over to Rohini Lakshmi as the first speaker. Rohini, over to you. Thank you, Vishakha. Thank you, ISST and HBS uh, India for having me over. Uh, I'll begin with something that I read early this month. Uh, this is a news report from Media Nama, which says that in Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh, if you were, quote unquote, moving near public toilets, uh, playing cards, or smoking in a public place with, quote unquote, women heavy footfall, or if you are someone who is, quote unquote, lurking at public spaces, you should expect to be tracked using 700 artificial intelligence based CCTV cameras. Uh, and the report goes on to say that the system is capable of storing facial data of 20,000 individuals in real time. It supports manual search like capabilities of a database comprising one lakh faces. Uh, and it can label faces as quote unquote blacklisted and generate alerts based on it. Now, in January this year, the same government uh, had uh, stated that it was rolling out a, another facial recognition program that was integrated with video surveillance technology that in, in public places that will gauge whether a woman is in distress based on her facial expressions uh, and send an alert to the police. Now, both these examples are from the same city. Uh, and the same, uh, uh, you know, they, they are about the same government department, but the use of uh, facial recognition integrated with video surveillance for public safety is not uncommon across India. It happens in different states. It's, it's also fairly common uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, now, the, the bit about uh, the AI technology gauging whether a woman is in distress based on her facial expressions in AI would be uh, for, would fall under the realm of emotion recognition among other other disciplines. Uh, and this brings me uh, to the question of what happens when such a technology is put in place. Uh, what kind of safeguards? Uh, are present, what remedies are available in the case of misuse or leaks, um, uh, public interventions uh, for, for safety and policing are often pitched as means for women's safety or for uh, fighting crimes against women or uh, SOS services. And since the start of the pandemic, uh, crime prevention technology and mass surveillance technology is being repurposed for COVID control. But I will come to the COVID bit later. Uh, now, we don't really know what happens when such kinds of biometric technologies are deployed. Have they been tested for their accuracy and efficacy in the conditions that they've been deployed in? So not in a laboratory 
not in the office of the technology vendor or not in a different country uh, and does it work does it generate what's called a false positive which means it mistakenly identifies someone based on their face uh, or on an image of their face uh, but it's not really that person uh, or what if it's a false negative which means the reverse scenario which means that it is indeed that person but the system does not recognize them as themselves uh, who has access to this data on whom is this technology used what are the purposes in which this data for which this data can be used where is it stored and how long uh, none of these questions currently have any answers in terms uh, of the one case uh, and context that i mentioned which is uh, uh, video surveillance policing in urban areas in india which are integrated with ai systems uh, and we do not have a personal data protection law or a corresponding regulator so so there is we, we cannot really demand to know what's what's going on uh, legally now uh apart from the question of accountability this also raises questions of uh surreptitious surveillance profiling of individuals harassment of individuals violations of civil rights so for example uh video surveillance cameras in public places were have been known to track down protesters demanding that the caa which is a citizenship law in india be rolled back and this was incidentally one of the places where this happened is the same city that i just mentioned um in many many years ago around around 2011 or 2012 or thereabouts a uh, cctv camera footage from the delhi metro uh, this was footage of couples canoodling inside uh, metro carriages uh, so young couples often do not have privacy in highly populated urban areas where where uh, members of the opposite sex interacting is not welcome so this this was uh, young couples uh, uh, taking advantage of the delhi metro carriage being empty uh, and getting cozy and this was recorded on the surveillance cameras inside the uh, uh, metro carriages and it somehow ended up on pornographic websites um as far as i know it was never discovered who was behind this kind of leakage but such voyeuristic uses of surveillance cameras camera networks is possible and and has happened in the past so uh, the point being that safeguards are needed because false positives happens because because abuse happens uh and coming back to uh, video surveillance systems being integrated with ai now ai is a very broad term and all of these surveillance systems are purchased by the government from third party vendors these are third party companies uh, and we do not know what goes into their software it's inscrutable it's a black box we don't know how effective they are what else they are doing what is it that they are transmitting back to uh, the the vendor uh, it's it's has it been independently audited by uh, by a neutral third party we don't really know we cannot uh, it's it's not easy to know because this is protected by you know ip law this is this is their uh, trade secret and so on uh but once they enter into a relationship with the government and they provide public infrastructure and public money is being spent on this this sort of infrastructure uh then they they there has to be some degree of accountability some degree of auditing to know what is it that actually goes into this this technology uh what is it capable of is it doing something it is not supposed to do how how effective is it how accurate is it uh and when we we speak of technology that's that's surveilling people that's capturing our images we are speaking of bodily autonomy we are speaking of dignity and privacy uh of people we are speaking of the fear of mass surveillance uh, and so on um so uh, without any kind of uh, independent audit 
without knowing what's what's going into this technology without knowing the sort of contracts that these third party vendors have with the government it's impossible to independently arrive on any assertion of its usefulness its accuracy uh in the the specific implementation or deployment that we are talking about and not in a controlled environment or in some other place uh also what happens in the case of false positives or false negatives because if let's say somebody is mistakenly identified that would just open the doors to harassment of that person uh moving on to covid technologies uh and a lot of uh these technologies were repurposed at the start of the pandemic very quickly uh in the name of desperate times desperate measures and so on so a lot of crime prevention technologies uh or crime monitoring technologies mass surveillance technologies were quickly repurposed uh for various things needed for the control of uh, covid-19 so uh in some countries and in india as well like there were mandatory apps for quarantine enforcement so if you are a quarantine person and you have a smartphone uh you have to mandatorily install an app uh, using which uh the local government can check on you on whether you are at home or in your quarantine facility or if you have you've left the place um electronic tracking devices such as bracelets or anklets uh which which were put on quarantine people either by themselves or they were used in conjunction with smartphone apps or qr codes another kind of wearable device that was used uh, was uh, bracelets for monitoring hand washing among workers because washing hands uh, is is one of the ways of uh, keeping the virus at bay uh, using a bracelet to monitor the movement of hands was was something that has that has uh, been tried uh devices that that will ensure or that will enforce social distancing at workplaces all of these uh, or a permutation combination of these have been tried in various different countries this is part of a forthcoming report that i'm working on for the institute of uh, human rights and business uh now again like with with uh, you know in in the previous case electronic wristbands may trigger false alarms you know they could result there could be a loss gps signal there could be a dead battery uh, the device vendors will receive and hold location data communicated by this device the use of this devices has has caused significant concerns over privacy and bodily autonomy and the dignity of the wearers uh in terms of the smartphone apps and you know our bodies the images of our bodies our devices smartphones uh they generate streams of data uh in terms of smartphone apps for for covid control uh i have studied dozens of apps and uh to uh, give the example of a couple of apps that were released in india sometime in 2020 uh for a uh, quarantine enforcement there was one app which had access to uh different sensors in the app including the accelerometer what this effectively means is that it was possible for the app maker to know whether you're sitting up or standing down whether you um are boarding a car or entering a bus this is in addition to the location permission so the gps location that will give you the exact location of the quarantined person uh this is the level to which surveillance of quarantine people is happening in that particular app the company also incidentally happens to provide uh video surveillance mass surveillance services to the government uh which integrates facial recognition technology in it and it has used this technology it is i mean the police has claimed that this te technology has been used to uh track down and catch quote and quote interstate robbers and so on so this is the same vendor that's using the same product but it's been repurposed into a smartphone app for quarantine enforcement in the same way there's another app there was i i i don't think it's functional anymore but a quarantine enforcement app where uh quarantine users were supposed to send um uh 
a selfie every hour to uh, uh, to the police i guess the police was handling it at that time uh, and about 12 12 selfies a day for all 14 days of their quarantine uh, and this selfie was to be matched uh, at the back end behind the scenes the the selfies were to be collected and they were to be matched against a database of the photographs of the quarantined people so these photographs were collected when these people arrived from abroad or something like that and the the selfie was to be matched with these photographs now like i said in the absence of legislation in the absence of safeguards what happens to these selfies who has access to it third party operators data entry operators were hired to uh do all this work of harvesting the selfies and then comparing it with the database uh and this affects people of all genders so it's people of all genders were supposed to submit selfies via these apps so i'm uh how much time do i have i think you should i do your own mute uh, can you wrap up soon okay uh I, yeah so i i have all of these questions about uh, uh you know bodily autonomy and devices that are that are used mostly as part of public interventions uh on the people and we and are often mandatory for people to use or even if they are not mandatory on paper they are in situations where they cannot avoid using them this is i i have these provocations on this topic thank you so much rohini and hopefully we can get some uh, you are on mute i'm not okay rohini only uh, she's not on mute like yeah oh. uh, we can hear you yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah thanks sure. and you know hopefully i think if people have any further questions about this we can take this at the end of all the presentations and hopefully come back to uh, some of the issues that you've highlighted right and we can go into it in more depth i wanted to invite anya kovach to go next uh, anya over to you and i'm going to again message you from time to time letting you know thanks so much pishaka and uh, thank you also to the organizers first of all for having me here today it's a, a real pleasure um, especially i think because i can see the participants friends even from across south asia and even beyond which is always a real pleasure i guess that's the advantage of being online right i wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the more theoretical background of why really we need to start looking at data politics as body politics and why these two are so closely intertwined and when we first started working on this at the internet democracy project first started thinking about this around 4 years ago our starting point was really the discomfort that we ourselves often felt and knew many of our friends had when for example we typed something that wasn't fully mainstream into a search engine and that discomfort was very visceral and the there seemed to be a discrepancy between what we felt and how data was talked about and so the starting point really was then that question of what is data where does this discomfort that we feel physically come from and why is this not reflected in any of the documents that we read about data and what we found was that really the way data is talked about predominantly today is as a resource data is considered as something that's just out there as a natural uh, resource ready to be mined then by whoever finds it first but completely disembodied from um, the medium that generates it this uh, way of thinking is pervasive across the world it's also very much reflected in indian government documents which even talk about data as a national asset which uh, the government should then held uh, as a trustee and have control over the origin from this perspective is uh, in the discipline of cybernetics which really came into its own after the second world war and you see the most extreme manifestations in that really in the dreams of scientists of downloading a human brain into a computer 
and talking about it as if that brain is still the same as the brain that was in a human being first. This is a really disembodied notion of data where, like I said, the medium that generates the data supposedly doesn't matter. But from our own experiences, we know that this does not match the reality. And I think Roini has already given many excellent examples. I'll, I'll talk about a few more. Um, recently in India, there was what came to be known as the Sulidale scandal. Sulidales was uh, an app which was hosted by GitHub and which basically featured uh, the images of Muslim women and auctioned them. Now, the way this is talked about in data protection debates is really as a pr data protection violation and a privacy violation, right? But the women who were affected about by this themselves spoke about it in quite a different way. They highlighted the fact that actually what was going on here was that their bodies were on sale. This wasn't just about the data. And so that point that Bishaka made in the introduction about how that line between our physical bodies and our data bodies has become so thin for them was very, very real. They knew that this was actually an embodied way that they were targeted, not just at the data level. This is one set of examples. And I think all cases of the non-consensual sharing of sexual images, when you look at the research women uh, who are predominantly, women and queer people are predominantly targets of this, they tend to talk about it in terms of sexual assault, not in terms of merely a data protection or a privacy violation. Um, you also see even more extreme examples of that, right? In the, India, we have Adar, the unique ID that most residents now have and that you need to access many government services. Um, what might happen is that you go to a ration shop the ration shop owner has known your family for 30 years, but if you try fingerprint identification and it fails, none of that matters anymore. And the fact that you're standing there in front of the shopkeeper suddenly becomes irrelevant. So the data about your body is actually more important than your body itself. And in these cases, this can become a matter of life and death. There have been repeated reports since 2015 of starvation that's on account of people not getting the rations they are legally entitled to because of fingerprint identification failures. And this has even continued to happen after the Supreme Court said that it would be illegal not to give people their rations in those cases. Um, one more uh, example I maybe want to briefly talk about are um, the ASHAs, community health workers in, for example, the state of Haryana in India, who uh, in the course of COVID were increasingly forced to digitize their work and then ask the government for smartphones, which they didn't necessarily have, uh, to actually conduct that work on. And when they got those smartphones, also were forced to download an app called Shield 360 which didn't only monitor and update their daily work targets, but also again, track their movements in real time via GPS, monitored their use of other apps and the internet, and also blocked a range of apps, including Facebook. Um, it also allowed healthcare uh, officials to actually remotely add, delete, or update any information on the mobile uh, applications on those work phones. And so what you saw again here is that really this became like a digital leash, right? Where the ASHA workers were not, it wasn't just their data that was controlled, through their data, there was an attempt to really fundamentally control every movement and action of ASHAs. And I would argue in this case, really inscribing them into a capitalist logic of efficiency and productivity, which is even more interesting seeing that ASHAs according to official rhetoric, are actually volunteers, and their remuneration is also according. The Aishas in Haryana protested. Uh, they don't, now don't have to download those apps anymore, but it shows how this is a recurring issue. And the number of examples really are endless. I mean, just in recent day, uh, Ruine gave the examples of apps uh, during co that were used during COVID-19. The Pegasus scandal was very much, again, about trying to control uh, people's actions, behavior, 
if not in real time, then in the future, the whole uh, current controversy around the biometrics that the Americans have left behind in Afghanistan for people, Af Afghan people they have worked with and what will happen now that that has fallen into the hands of uh, the Taliban. All of these are really part of that same paradigm. All of this points, again, as Bishaka said, to how we have a paradigm shift in how our bodies are conceptualized, where that line between the virtual body and the physical body is becoming so thin that it is becoming irrelevant. And this is really two-way traffic, right? It is not just that our bodies are translated into data, but also that the data that we provide is actually used to, in turn, try and discipline and control our bodies. And so it is really um, at all levels that our bodies are kind of targeted in this whole, the entire life cycle really of, of uh, uh, data. I think it's really important for us to actually recognize that there is a fundamental shift here and that we cannot continue to talk about data as a resource or about bodies the way that we did in the past but that we really need to recognize that embodied data is now a part of our extended bodies to imagine all the harms and possibilities, both of them actually, uh, that this new era is providing us with and to really think through this shift fully, to acknowledge it fully. To give you one example of where that might go, in the Internet Democracy Project, we look for example on uh, the, at debates around consent. I did this with my colleague, Chetty Jane, um, and we asked if consent at the moment online is such a problem, and there are so many, we all know, right? You take that box, you don't even really know what you have agreed to. It's also weird because privacy supposedly is a fundamental human right in many jurisdictions. There are no other fundamental human rights we can sign away, and yes, in this case, it's possible. Um, if we want to address this, how does it shift if we put bodies back into the debate? And so we actually went to look back at looking at debates around sexual consent in feminism to really ask that very question, because that is a very rich ground where uh, a very embodied understanding of consent already exists. And of course, what we came to was one of the crucial findings of feminism in these debates, the crucial point is really that um, we have to always be conscious of power relationships when we assess whether it was possible to give meaningful consent or not. And if you just look at that one, that one issue, you can already see how many ways there are in which at the moment consent online is not meaningful and which needs to be substantially addressed if we want to actually fundamentally uh, uh, protect our bodies. Just the fact that you cannot negotiate these contracts. You cannot say, no, I don't want you to give this to all kinds of third, my data to all kinds of third party for uh, uh, marketing purposes. The power imbalance between us and companies at the moment is so big that we have no scope whatsoever. And so putting bodies back into that debate really shows in much starker profile some of the problems with the current architecture, but also it gives us a new language to actually uh, move forward. And um, not just talk about harms, say, in terms of data protection violations, as happens today, but also in terms of, for example, bodily integrity and broader questions of human dignity. I think really acknowledging this uh, shift is also really important uh, because I think in India, we've over the last few decades and still in the past few years even, we've continued to make really important gains in terms of the protection of women's rights when it came to their autonomy and bodily integrity. There is still way to go. Uh, marital rape is still an exception in rape law, for example, in India. But nevertheless, there has been considerable acknowledgement and we've made real progress. But that's still looking at bodies in this very, uh, in, a, in a, a traditional physical way, I'll say. What we see now is that actually with digitization, because the control that happens over us, the violations that happen over us, 
are slightly less tangible. They are at some remove. All of these gains are again being undermined in some way or the other. And if we do not actually recognize that connection between data and bodies, we will not have a language or um, a, a ground to stand on to fight this. So I would really also call to see the importance of the data politics as body politics and the close links in that sense. Um, if you put beta bodies back into the debate or debate, you will see that this is really a new frontier for feminism. And if we don't take up this struggle now, I'm really worried where we will be when it comes to uh, women's rights, autonomy, dignity in 50 years time, whether it is digitized or not digitized. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anya. Uh, our final speaker today is Brinda Lakshmi. Over to you, Brinda. Thanks, Vishaka. Um, so I am going to be looking at tipping on what Vishaka mentioned about uh, the feminist approach and feminist movement and queer movements, right? I'm going to be looking at how the social understanding of gender influences body politics and big data. Uh, the feminist and queer movements for long have been struggling to for the individual autonomy and agency of women and queer people to be recognized and for them to be seen as valid, complete human beings, right? Body politics has been at the center of this struggle. It has always been about our bodies and how it is perceived and what we uh, can do with it. If, we, if one were to take a closer look at body politics, we'd realize that it is also connected to one's perceived understanding of gender. Um, what makes a woman a woman? Who is a real man or man enough? Um, who is transgender? How is a transgender person supposed to look, sound or behave? I mean, I'm putting forth just some questions that we need to think about uh, when we're talking about gender. And all this in one way or another is connected to our bodies and how gender is supposed to play out through our body. For example, what clothes we wear, how we talk, walk, the length of our hair, the profession we practice, what can we do and cannot do. For instance, girls cannot step out of the sunset. I mean, that still happens in many parts of the country. Menstruating women and girls shouldn't enter the kitchen. So uh, this is also something that is still, that still continues. So here it is also important to understand the distinction between sex and gender. Why? Because clearly that, that, that biology seems to play a role in understanding gender. So sex is, sex is biological or assigned sex at birth is based on biology, uh, sex organs, anatomy, and chromosomes. So example of sexes would be male, female, intersex. Now, gender, on the other hand, is society's set of expectations, standards, uh, and characteristics about how men and women are supposed to act. Again, this is a very binary understanding. As uh, we know now that there are more than just uh, men and women. There are other genders as well. There are there's trans women, trans men, gender fluid people, gender uh, queer, non-binary, and many others. But if we were to go by the uh, conventional understanding of gender being binary, then example again would be girls are supposed to like pink, boys are supposed to like blue. And the age-old habit of the patriarchal world has been to limit the understanding of gender to one's body. For instance, if you were assigned female sex at birth, then you can only be a woman. You most definitely cannot do things that a man can and cannot be a man. And if you are a woman, then you are most definitely weak. If you were assigned male at birth and experience your gender as a woman, then you must be less than to want to lower yourself to the level of being a woman. I mean, uh, these are, even for me to say many of these things is quite triggering for me even. So I apologize if it regard anyone, but that wasn't my intention. But these are some of the fundamental uh, beliefs that exist in the patriarchal society and how this plays out in the world, even without technology. 
these stereotypes now continue even in the digital world uh, and with the use of technology. Uh, inherently, digital technology is a tool of privilege. The fact that we are able to access it, understand it and use it makes us a privileged group of people, all of us even present in this uh, discussion today. In most parts of the country, uh, gender minorities, both women and transgender persons, have the least amount of access to the internet and or smart devices as well. Without any consideration about uh, this lack of access to a large section of the population, there's been an increased push uh, for a biometric-based digital ID, uh, Aadhaar, right, uh, to access state welfare services. And as Anya mentioned, uh, you know, government is pushing for it also as a public good, data as a public good as well. And this has increased more with the pandemic. And this has significantly shifted the understanding around identification and citizenship. Identification and citizenship now has come to mean that a person is under constant surveillance, under the constant surveillance of the state. And uh, this includes disclosing details about oneself, including uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, marital status, among others. Public policies governing essential services like healthcare reflect these age-old uh, values that I mentioned, uh, which existed in the offline world by mandating the use of Aadhaar to be able to access these services. For instance, mothers who cannot produce their husband's Aadhaar and their own Aadhaar cannot access maternal benefits. What does the this essentially means? That only a child born legitimately out of, you know, like, by a, from a woman who's married has the right or only a married woman has uh, the right to access uh, welfare, maternal benefit. This is essentially a human right violation, but then uh, that's also the design of the policy. What about single women, single mothers? They may be single mother, mothers for so many different reasons, right? And similarly, accessing abortion services in the public healthcare uh, system without an Aadhaar is also not possible. This again is constant close surveillance of what an individual does with their body. And there's also mandatory use of Aadhaar for a life-affirming treatment like the antiretroviral therapy, HIV. And uh, this has also resulted in many discontinuing the treatment, fearing the breach of their privacy. And rightly so, because the instances of data breaches have uh, been quite have become quite common now in the country. So the use of a digital ID to authenticate the use of a public health service also tracks the now individuals terms of engagement with another consenting adult in order to access essential sexual and reproductive health services, right? As we've seen with single mothers, cis uh, women and non-binary persons accessing abortion services and even the professional agency of uh, female and trans sex workers is also controlled in this manner. Uh, it takes into consideration like it's two consenting adults are involved in the transact in this engagement but uh, the state seems to want to know about it uh, for some reason. So there is conscious either conscious ignorance or erasure of the right to privacy for individuals, especially from the gender and sexual minorities by virtue of their gender and or sexuality. Similarly, according to the new transgender law, Transgender right, uh, Persons Protection of Rights Act 2019, transgender persons are expected to produce a medical certificate to be able to self-identify their gender within the binary on their IDs, including other. Prior to the passing of the new law, some Indian states also had a screening committee to issue transgender identity cards to transgender persons. Often individuals were subject to horrific human rights violations, including body checks, during this process uh, in order to prove their gender identity. Uh, cisgender persons are not required to prove their gender identity in such an intrusive manner. Cisgender or not, transgender or not, Nobody should be subject to this kind of bodily, uh, intrusive bodily checks, right? And this is essentially body politics about this is exactly why we need to understand the distinction between sex and gender 
uh, which sex can be what gender and what we can do and cannot do, right? And according to this new law, ID change process continues to demand an existing ID in uh, one's given name and assigned gender for both digital and offline processes. And it is common for transgender persons to flee their homes due to the stigma, discrimination, and abuse that they face uh, from their natal family for being transgender. While fleeing their home, many do not leave their homes with an ID document. And this impacts their ability to enter data systems in their preferred name and gender. And without being a part of these data sets, they cannot access any state welfare. Like Anya mentioned, like your body matters more even if you're right in front of the ration shop owner, it doesn't matter. So the continued inability then of individuals to enter data systems will lead to their civil death and with a diminishing data set of a particular identity, in this case, transgender persons. This could even lead to the erasure of a whole population group over time, uh, saying that we don't have enough uh, we don't have enough transgender persons in our state, so we don't need to actually make a policy to address their needs. Can be said, and it has actually been said before in some states. So the insistence of data to make welfare decisions, including healthcare, has the potential to hard code existing offline biases into digital data systems, as can be seen with accessing maternal benefits, abortion services, HIV, all that I've mentioned so far. Uh, with digitization, disclosure of one's gender and sexuality has become, in fact, an hindrance to accessing one's rights, right? Uh, what kind of data is collected about us? However, the inability to disclose these details also means exclusion. You, you're not in the data set with the right details. You don't get access to state welfare. In a country where anything related to sexuality is considered shameful, it becomes an additional burden when individuals are forced to reveal details related to their gender identity and or sexuality to access their constitutionally sanctioned human rights. An increase in people discontinuing the use of a certain service due to privacy concerns, say single mother or trans persons, would mean biased data sets that don't reflect all realities. These data sets will not reflect the reality of transgender persons, single mothers, single women and others, right? And if these biased data sets are then fed into automated decision-making systems that use artificial intelligence and machine learning to make decisions, which is what is being pushed now in the country with all the different policy changes, the decisions are likely to be biased. It doesn't end there, there's more to it. Now with AI and automated decision-making systems, how will certain highly sensitive details such as HIV status, number of abortions undergone, or gender identity determine the eligibility of a person's access to insurance service and healthcare. How will the algorithms uh, affect them? How will this access be further shaped by other data such as caste or religion or disability status, identities that have been historically used to discriminate against individuals in our country? What is the morality that is being used to shape the understanding of these systems? What is the interpretation of reality that we're allowed to exist within? We don't have clear answers to these questions right now. However, one thing is quite evident and clear. The mandatory use of a digital ID, the data breaches and continued exclusions, right? Based on these IDs, then significantly is reshaping our understanding of an individual's agency, our right to bodily autonomy and consent, and thereby also rewriting our understanding of gender, gender roles, and what we can and cannot do with our bodies. And this, all this essentially makes it uh, a very important feminist issue. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brinda. Uh, I think before we go to the questions, I just wanted to thank all the panelists for raising really a uh, rich set of issues. And, you know, just to flag a few of them, it's impossible to sort of do justice to the full range of them. But I think Rohini asked an interesting question in her presentation, which is the assumption that data can protect the body. 
through the examples that she gave. Uh, Anya touched upon the whole body data definition as well as the whole question of privacy versus personhood, right? What should we really be foregrounding in policy? Uh, Brinda talked about the politics of visibility and invisibility uh, when it comes to bodies and data. I think everybody really referred to the power and privilege underlying these systems, right? And how can we really work to um, challenge these bodies of power? And I think related to this again is the whole question of norms going online or norms becoming datafied, just as our bodies are turning into data, the norms, whether they relate to gender, sexuality, uh, disability, so many other things are also accompanying us and sort of congealing into data. So how do we challenge that as well? Uh, before we open it up for questions, and I see there's one question in chat already, so I'll ask the panelists if they can look at that. I think one of the things that I wanted to touch on very briefly is that every time we have panels about bodies and data, uh, or about sort of datafication and the politics of data, uh, there are always questions around, you know, how do we challenge this? What can we do to challenge this? And while there are no sort of, uh, you know, like there's no checklist of how this can be challenged, I just wanted to touch on very briefly a few discourses that are beginning to challenge sort of the way in which data is constructed, right, globally and in India. I think conceptually one of them is data colonialism, which really challenges the sort of positioning of data as the new oil and refers to it as a extractive neo-colonialist practice in an era of surveillance capitalism. There's also the discourse of data justice, which starts from the premise that the greatest burden of data valence is borne by those who are marginalized and tries to bring a social justice framework to data governance. So sort of combining the politics of visibility and invisibility, engagement and disengagement with technology and anti-discrimination. And it's an interesting approach, which also can, uh, asks whether it's enough to actually talk about individual rights if we try to sort of combat data harms. There are also a number of groups around the world that are really talking about using data, like flipping it, turning it around, right? Saying that data has too often been used as an instrument of oppression to reinforce inequality and perpetuate injustice against vulnerable or marginalized bodies. So a lot of organizations are just exploring how this can be turned around. And can data even be used instead to reverse oppression, right? So there's data for Black lives in the US. There's a whole movement around what is called data for good. How can you use data to improve society? There is, a, there is an agency called Data 2X set up by the United Nations that really looks at data for gender equality arguing that gender has always been a critical factor in data inequalities, right? And there's also the responsible data approach, which talks about uh, taking a, you know, us all having a collective duty to account for the unintended consequences of working with data. Uh, and this talks a lot about our rights to consent, privacy, security, and ownership also when using data in our own social change and advocacy efforts and implementing values and practices of transparency and openness when we ourselves use data in our own work. There's also the whole questions around, you know, should we be talking about community data? For example, who owns data such as farming data, right? About land or soil, climate, farming practices, is it collectively owned or is it individually owned? How do we think about this? And finally, another promising approach is actually an approach that is called data feminism, which really looks at how data science today is a form of power 
And the questions that data feminism asks are integral questions, which is data by whom, data for whom, and data science with whose interests in mind, and really argues for sort of bringing in a much more intersectional feminist lens and really challenging the differentials of power around the production, uh, collection, storage, use, etc., and generation of data. So just wanted to leave you all a little bit. This is a really big, uh, you know, the whole question of bodies and data is, data is really a huge question, sort of apartheid level or Berlin Wall fall kind of level. So no easy answers. But on that note, I did want to open it up for questions. Um, if I can ask all the panelists to also turn on their videos. And if, we, if I could address the first question to all of you and anybody, you know, just raise your hand or start answering. So I think the one came up earlier, just a moment. Yeah, okay. This was the first question that I saw, which said, is there any way of feminists deciding what is the minimum amount of personal data that can be given to be digitized, which may be necessary for entitlements without it being manipulated or expanded in distorted ways? Just a loud thought, since I wonder if we can take a stand that we will not give any data. Anya, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thanks, Vishaka. So I think the question is, to start with, not so much about what are minimal amounts of data. Also, because if you ask me, and so coming back to the debate around consent, right? When you just start to engage with somebody sexually, have, giving consent at every step is really quite important, right? But if you've been with somebody long enough, there is a different space that you allow the other person, right? And as long as you don't feel that has been violated, the next time again, there is some taken for grantedness that happens. And I often think like, I want my rights to be respected much more narrowly, but some of the companies I really trust, over time, I would also think, well, if you ask me for more data and you say like, look, we want to experiment with X, Y, Z, but we need more data. And I feel in the past, you have behaved in ways that actually deserve my trust. I might actually say, yeah, I'll take more than you need. It's not necessarily about the minimal amount. I think it is really about principles of how we create the space in which we give the data and what control we have over that data, both in terms of um, what we give and what happens to us when we access data, when we access the platform, etc. And that means, first of all, that there need to be a whole number of design principles in place where certain things should just not be allowed. To give you an example, um, in Estonia, uh, it's one of the most digitized countries in the world. The government is very heavily digitized, but the digital systems, and this has still been criticized, but as an example, the digital systems are organized in such a way that you as a user can log in and can each time see which government service has been accessing your data. The law is such that only the people who are working on a department that they need this particular piece of data for can access this particular piece of data, so they can't see your entire profile. And if you log in and feel that somebody accessed something which they shouldn't have been able to, you can file a complaint. So as a user, you have tremendous insight. In India, you give your data to one government department and then basically it can go anywhere, which means that even if we would put protections on say, this agency or that agency can only collect in limited circumstances, as long as government agencies are basically able to share amongst each other, these restrictions mean absolutely nothing, right? So this is, there are hundreds of those kind of examples where really it's at the design level that we need to start building in principles to think through what should not be allowed. The second thing I think that's really important is also to start thinking much more about what input we can have, right? Because again, I think at the moment, it's all or nothing. And it doesn't have to be like that. And if we put the question, the issue of bodies and embodied data on the table, I think we have a very different language to start talking about 
If I meet you physically, I will decide slowly what data to give. And there is a whole bunch of data I expect you not to share with others. Why can't I do that online? So there are many more parallels we can start to draw like that. But in both cases, whether it's about what individual rights are or the design level, I really think the matter here is one of principles rather than trying to predetermine what is the minimal amount of data or what data, because that is so context specific. Thanks, Anya. Brinda, you wanted to pitch into this. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a question that <clears throat> Uh, is is actually uh, that is something that I asked my respondents in my study and as trans persons, uh, you know, ID documents and gender is such a challenge. And I think that that's I have got some great answers in the sense. What are you collecting that information for gender data? What are you collecting gender data for, for instance? Uh, why do you need uh, like gender on, say, your driver's license. It's just actually a, like it's a certifying, essentially a certificate to say that you can drive. Why is gender relevant there? So ask for the data only where it is necessary and otherwise there's going to be function creep and that's what is essentially happening uh, everywhere. And it becomes about then also when you match it with facial recognition saying what, where do you actually need photo as well. Again, it will be a challenge for trans persons to be able to match that. So these are all uh, these are all aspects that need to be taken into consideration at a design stage itself. And the imagination of people working on this has not gone beyond the given so far. Thanks, Brinda. Um, I think, you know, when you were talking about it, one of the points that struck me, like what are you collecting data for, right? What are you collecting gender data for? Is that I think one of the unintended consequences, maybe I'm phrasing it wrongly, of a data fight society is that everybody starts feeling they should collect more data, right? Whether you need it or not. So I actually saw recently we were doing a little survey uh, from point of view with the nonprofit I work at. And when we were going over it, there were several questions which were collecting data. But again, we had to ask ourselves the exact same question that you posed, right? Why do we need to know this, right? What will it actually change about the survey that we are doing? Is it even relevant? And we ended up actually striking out a lot of the questions. So it's kind of how data also works insidiously, right? Everybody starts feeling like, oh, we need more data about this, about that, or somehow we are sort of, you know, not valid enough or whatever. Um, moving on to the next question, uh, how do you suggest, given the power differentials of stakeholders in the digital world, we as individuals and as, and as members of civil society with our feminist body of work, intervene into the field of data and technology. I can take it if nobody else does. <laughs> sure. I think first of all, what's really important is actually developing a language because the, the, the narrative of data as a resource the way all of, like even what Bishak was saying now about like, yeah, everybody's acting as if like gathering data is by default a good thing. That's again possible when you think about data as a resource. The government talking about data as a national asset, that's possible if you think of data as a resource. If you think of data as bodies, the government talking about data as a national asset actually becomes a really, really spooky idea. It's the same like the way consent is used on the internet right now is to say, but you take the box, no, you agreed. And what is the language you have? If you think of data as a resource, you've made a transaction there, right? You have that resource, you've traded it, now you got that service, this is it. If you think of that transaction as similar to sexual relationships as involving bodies, questions of human dignity, autonomy, et cetera, come into the picture where it doesn't become so easy anymore to say, ah, but you agreed, right? We don't allow sexual relations between say college professors and students, not because they might not genuinely be in love, but because 
the power imbalance is such that there are questions there that make people say, well, wait until that person has graduated before you go there. Online, we don't do any of that. So, and we can't, as long as we talk about data as a resource, we can't. So I really think the first thing is to talk about, uh, to develop a collective language in which we talk about these challenges differently so that we can put them on the agenda in much tougher terms than we are able if we are limited to data violation or privacy debates. And the second thing is like with everything organized, right? <laughs> I mean, um, I find it really interesting how even when I talk to say techies uh, about the perspective we have, they usually start out with being really skeptical, but the more examples we give, they recognize this in their own life. It's not alien to people. It makes sense, right? Um, so I think it's really also about once you have that language, finding allies, organize across different stakeholder groups, et cetera. We're not going to win this battle in the next two years, but if we work really hard, we make connections, maybe in the next 10 years, we can shift something. And if we can't by then, I'm a bit worried about what the future will look like. Thanks, Sanya. Um... Rohini, I wonder if you would like to answer the next question, which is about how can technology and data be reclaimed through feminist tech and feminist circles? Um, so in theory, it's, it's possible to have feminist infrastructure, but uh, building infrastructure and maintaining infrastructure is extremely resource intensive. So until feminist movements are better resourced, and I'm using the term feminist movements to include everything, civil society, NGOs, individuals, everything, uh, running feminist infrastructures is slightly tricky uh, or is, is challenging without, without the adequate uh, amount of resources. Feminist tech and feminist servers, yes, uh, you, we, we can have a collective understanding of what is feminist technology and what is feminist infrastructure. And to an extent, we can, uh, we can take back some of the power and the space. Uh, however, the, the examples that I just recounted uh, that I that I gave in my presentation, uh, those are mostly relationships with the state or with uh, 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 you know with uh, say the police or with uh, uh, the state in a situation of quote unquote emergency, which means that the state has the power to derogate your rights. Uh, this is where the the imbalance of power is really stuck so while we can say we we'll, we we'll run our own email servers um and you know have control of our data and have control of our communications and information uh we need all of this as well to have that feminist reality thanks very much Rohini. i think uh, there's another question also about is there a global movement to have apps to be allowed fewer stuff like i guess less data from our phones now it's all on them. does anybody would anybody know of any such efforts so there are design principles uh, there are of course the data protection principles which have been embedded into laws like the gdpr but there are design principles about what a uh, good app looks like what are quote unquote feminist apps what a privacy respecting app uh, looks like uh, so those um, principles of coding, principles of design, uh, those already exist. Great, thanks, Rohini. If you can, if you know of any which you can easily access, please do put it in the chat for people to follow up on any links that are easily accessible. And the next question is again: uh, Can you elaborate on how one's physical bodies are threatened with reference to their digital bodies? How is data governance determining bodily autonomy? I think that... Brinda, would you like to? Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
so like i mentioned right the digital body like uh, there have been uh, municipal workers who are tracked with uh, uh, tracking bands it's it's essentially like workers being on leash right and tracking their every move which part are they going in cleaning and they are not you know this is again the digital body impacting their physical body and also um, on the other end there is also there is we need to acknowledge the caste play that plays here who which people from which castes are actually there doing that it's like somewhere by doing that there is a lack of how do we understand trust trust the understanding of trust changes and it is like again uh, if if uh, the caste of all these people their names is going to be data fight for instance and we are saying we are tracking all of them we are also saying that trust on people from a certain community are to be at a certain level and they need to be like surveillance is okay because they are not trustworthy similarly when you data file like that is also the going to be the problem with the criminal data also in the country right it is again about body the offenses uh, as such there is a certain kind of prejudice against certain communities and that's again going to play out in so these are all this is not this is going beyond gender it is it is not just gender and when we look at gender it gets further uh, like offenses against women of a certain community like you said the suli deals that is again body and uh, how digital body impacts our physical body as well um, these are just some examples thanks very much binda i think we are I uh, have about 5 minutes left there's a couple of questions which i think maybe there's one about uh, you know if anyone knows of a study that look unity around the acceptance of terms and conditions as part of consent i think if anyone of you all know about that if you could just put it into the chat for the person to look up i think that would be helpful i think i am going to ask actually a question which uh, maybe all three of you can answer which will take us the last question which is what examples do we have where the tech world has responded to the questions of data justice or the pushback on data as a resource and the part of the question is is the changed cookie policy a part of it where we now get to use how we want the cookies to be used um yeah so that sort of the but i think the broader question is uh, if anybody has examples of you know responding to questions of data justice this is also i think the moment for each of you to have a final sort of say so um if we can go in the same order rohini would you like to start um so in conclusion i i'd say that there's greater need to uh, evaluate whatever's uh, happening and and tracking down the sheer you know barrage of technology that's been happening for more than a decade now you know it began with things like safety apps and panic buttons in uh, public transport uh, safety apps marketed as uh, distress apps for women uh, and it is now um, uh expanded into the domain of you know mass surveillance and so on but there's no there is there is very little tracking down of this technology and accountability surrounding it so we we need to dwell on that and and focus more on how how do we ensure this happens thanks very much rohini another question crept in so if you all you know want to put that in your concluding remarks also basically about in your experience do you think a personal data protection bill will be enough to mitigate the threats mentioned today um so over to you anya yeah uh thanks vishaka i think uh, on the cookie policy and the broader question around that uh being able to set your cookie settings i think is a step forward it's still also part of a problem though because again it puts the burden completely on the individual right so if you come back to that whole question of power relationships that isn't fundamentally addressed 
The question is, should all of these cookies be allowed in the first place? Right? If you look at the number of third party uh, data providers that often your data is shared with, for apps even as sensitive as say a dating app like OkCupid, which a European consumer organization did research into, it's literally hundreds or thousands of third parties that get data on all these yes, no questions that you answer. Are you in favor of abortion, yes or no? Do you really want hundreds of third parties to know that kind of information? It shouldn't just be on you as an individual to be informed, right? It's in the same way that we say, like we need safe cities, we need safe environments, we need street lighting. It's not up to you to always make sure there is enough light or you're not outside. Um, so it's a very similar thing. The, the choice on the cookies is, in, is a step forward. And I do think if you look, say, for example, at the moment at the general data protection regulation in the EU, which is the uh, considered by and large like the gold standard at the moment for what we have for data protection uh, regulation, it puts people central in ways that say the data protection bill in India does people and their rights, which is also in some parts of the world, you have much stronger responses against the use of biometric data in public spaces by government or by private companies than you have in India, right? It's a different, they've, historically Europe has worked on a different paradigm, even from the US, uh, much more rights focused, much more people focused. And so that's a step forward. But even there, that recognition of bodies being central is still not there. And so even though the GDPR right now is perhaps the gold standard, it's not the gold standard by all for all times. Part of the challenge here is also, this comes also back to the question about what interventions are needed. So I really believe we're in a paradigm shift. The problem when you're in a paradigm shift is that it's really hard to see it while it's going on, right? And it's also really hard to fully imagine where we want to get it because everything is new. And in many ways, we're still trying to address all this change with tools from the past, which are not necessarily helpful or appropriate anymore. So we see pushback, but still stopping at really the questioning of data as a resource um, doesn't help. When it comes to the personal data protection bill, definitely the Indian version is not going to solve the problem. <laughs> I'm happy to uh, talk offline more about it if you would like to. Thanks, Sanya. Over to you, Brinda. Uh, for me, as, as a feminist working on human rights as the focus, uh, I see that with technology, with all that's going on in the world, right, with the pandemic, with or without a pandemic, we are so much in trying to just make ends meet that uh, we don't focus on what it is that we're giving or not giving. And that's just, and, it's, and it seems to be by design. And uh, if we don't take cognizance of it, the very understanding of being human itself is changing slowly with time. And we are not paying attention to it. We are not aware of it because we're very busy making ends meet. And when we're talking about the first PDP bill, for instance, like uh, Anya mentioned, and I also like data as the public good is the focus, the center of that bill. Data is the center, not there is no mention of privacy there. So it's essentially not a privacy law. It's about data being protected and not us as individuals or citizens of India, right? I mean, I, I don't like to use the word citizen because even that is a very contested word, but even citizens, let's say we're talking only about citizens, even our data is not protected or that, that bill is not really going to cut it. Thank you so much, Brinda. Thank you again, Rohini, Brinda, and Anya for a really illuminating discussion. I was furiously taking notes in between listening to all of you all. Thanks again, and I'd like to hand it back to Sri Rupa and Rajiv uh, for any concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bishaka. Thanks, Bishaka. Uh, now we have arrived at the end of today's discussion forum. On behalf of ISST and HBS, I would like to extend a sincere gratitude to all the speakers and the chair. Many thanks for making the debates around body politics and embodiment more accessible today to, through this discussion, for sharing your perceptive insights and for discussing diverse everyday examples which have highlighted the importance of these issues for all, particularly for marginalized communities, 
uh, more so has spotlighted big data and data governance as possibly the new frontier of feminist struggles and has provoked the possibilities of data feminism. Thank you so much for providing an intersectional feminist lens with a focus on embodiment. I would also like to thank HPS for supporting this discussion forum uh, for nine years now, and we hope to continue our partnership to facilitate critical dialogues on some of the most important issues of our society. More importantly, I'd like to thank the participants for joining us today and for making the dialogue so engaging. A shout out also to the ISSD team who have worked in the background to make this happen today. Uh, to all the participants, we would be sharing an online feedback form with all of you and request you to kindly fill the form with your feedback, which would be very helpful to us in informing our future discussion. Um, also to let you know that you can also do this anonymously. Uh, so thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you all again for our upcoming future uh, event sometime later this year. Until then, a very good evening to everyone. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Good, good night.